going out on a Friday night like this. Uh, we have some folks here from Ohio that uh, are from uh, Brother David Reed. For everybody that doesn't know, this is uh, Brother David Reed. He's the uh, pastor of Columbus Bible Church in Columbus, Michigan. And he and I have been working on uh, the project that we're going to be presenting to you uh, this weekend for quite some time. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a second as soon as I get this thing uh, situated. There is now. <laughs> All right, as I was saying, it's very nice to look out and see so many uh, people here on a Friday night. Um, if you look at the front cover, by the way, all of you are, feel free to take for free one of the um, little spiral bound notebooks that is on the table in front of you. This is something that we've been putting together. Uh, Dave and I have been working on this for the last few months, uh, refining it, drafting it, um, making sure that um, it got in the format that we were happy with. The, the title of the weekend is uh, The Day of the Lord Project. And it's a collaborative effort with, with, with Grace Life Bible Church, obviously, here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Columbus Bible Church, as I said, from Columbus, Ohio. And if you look at the front cover, the purpose of the project is to accurately identify the nature and timing of the day of the Lord in Scripture. All the notes in this book that were presented at Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, over the weekend of March 9 through 11, 2012, written and presented by Brian Ross and David Reed. Um, so here's kind of the format we're going to use here. If you've been to one of our previous conferences, it was more of a production, okay? We had a lot of singing, a lot of things going on, uh, and what we decided to do this time is to just keep it very simple and to really just focus on the reason we're here, and that's to just study the Bible, okay? So help yourself to the snacks and stuff like that. Tomorrow for lunch, I have a big pizza order in. Um, so if you're planning to come, we just would like to collect uh, $5 from you to help pay for the pizza, and that's the only uh, expense you should have for the weekend unless you choose to uh, make a, a, do a donation uh, or, or something else, okay? So we're going to be very informal. Now, the plan that we discussed was to allow questions at the end of each uh, session, okay? So I'm going to teach through, we're going to teach through the notes for each lesson, and then at the end, uh, there's some built-in time to the schedule for some questions if there are any. So that's why, like tonight, we were going to start at 6.30, teach for a while, have a break, and then not start again until 8. I will say that tomorrow morning, when we have three in a row, we'll be a little bit more tight on time uh, than we are tonight and tomorrow afternoon, but um, we'll, we want you to ask questions. We just want you to kind of try to hold them off until at the end of each session. The idea for the Day of the Lord Project really began, if you, if you would find page two, and, and I'm going to start going through lesson one now. The idea for the project really began about, um, in 2005, so about 12 years ago, um, there was a, some dispute amongst some of the, some Bible teachers regarding some things related to the pre-tribulation rapture and uh, David and I were at a meeting, and there were some things that were discussed, and one of the things that I, well, we, we both came away from the meeting not real satisfied with some of the things that were being said about what the day of the Lord was, when it, when it was going to happen, and what it entailed, and so forth. And at first, um, we were sort of studying some things independently at first. We weren't really discussing anything for about almost six months to a year. And then one day I, I called him up and I said, hey, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff that, that I'm seeing and, and, and get your, you know, your, your take on it, your feedback on it. And come to discover that he'd been studying the exact same things and was coming to the exact same conclusions that I was. And we hadn't really even had any uh, conversation or anything amongst ourselves about that. So then the idea sort of developed over time to have a conference devoted solely to looking at issues related to the nature and timing of the day of the Lord and some other uh, related subjects that would go along with that. So that's kind of when the, where the idea came from. And so we've been working on refining these things for the past, really, almost seven years. Okay, so um, I'm glad you're here. And if you would, I'm just going to go through this. Uh, those of you that are in my uh, church history class know uh, typically 
how I do these things, and uh, we're going to kind of follow just a similar format. So, the reason we're here this weekend is to accurately identify the day of the Lord. Okay? There are two, there are, there are fundamentally, Dave and I feel there are fundamentally two major issues that are a challenge to this. Okay? And if you look at your notes, the first one is the insistence on the part of premillennial dispensationalists that the only way the day of the Lord can come as a thief in the night is to include the 70th week of Daniel, or the tribulation period, in the day of the Lord. Consequently, accurately understanding the thief in the night terminology is going to be very critical to identifying some issues related to the day of the Lord. So the first challenge here is... It's a commonly held view, and I'll show you in a few minutes why and where that idea comes from, that the only way the day of the Lord can come as a thief in the night is if it includes the uh, entire tribulation period within the day of the Lord. So that, that, that's certainly an issue that we're going to have to uh, go over. If you would turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> the second issue is um, slightly different in nature. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says here, he's writing to the, the Thessalonians, and he, he says in verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Now you see there in verse 2 where it says the day of Christ. Everybody sees that? Okay. The, it's a commonly held view, and it's, it's held not only by, even amongst uh, other mid acts dispensationalists, people that view the church divided Christ as starting with the uh, ministry of the Apostle Paul, have suggested that day of Christ here in the King James Bible is wrong, okay? And they have said that it should really be the day of the Lord. So, another, another thing that we have to discuss is... This, this uh, so-called discrepancy here, where, where the King James says the day of Christ, and commentators are going to come, and if you read a commentary on the, on the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 2, almost universally they will tell you that this is a mistranslation here, and it should be the day of the Lord, not the day of Christ. But if you look at your notes here, the, 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 the fact that anybody would suggest this really demonstrates a lack of understanding because the, the, the Greek word, the reason that says Christ in English is because it says Christos in Greek. Okay? Christos, every time that word appears, it's always translated Christ. And as it says in your notes there, it's done that way 568 times with no exception. Okay? So there's no textual reason why all of a sudden when we come to this verse... Now we should change it from the day of Christ to read the day of the Lord. Now, if you you'll see maybe tonight, but for sure tomorrow, why some people want to tell you that because on the surface it seems like it clears up some issues, but there's no there's no textual reason for doing it. Okay, there's no reason why. <clears throat> if you look at your notes, it says I'm about halfway through that that lengthy point number four there. It says the day of Christ is the correct translation. The doctoring of the text is done because most mid ex dispensationalists view the day of Christ as the rapture of the church. In their view, the day of Christ, if the day of Christ were allowed to stand, a problem is created in verse 3, when Paul says, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Look again with me at verse 2. <coughs> so here is why they're making the suggestion. Verse 2, uh, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by word, neither by, sorry, by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, the day of Christ is at hand. Well, what day is he talking about, verse 2? He says the day of Christ, right? Well, a lot of people, and you'll see why tomorrow, they identify the day of Christ as the rapture, okay? But then if you read the next verse, it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Well, what day is he talking about? He's talking about the day of Christ. And then if you make the day of Christ the rapture, now, look, read the rest of verse 3, For that day shall not come, except it come falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So the reason they want to the reason they want to make suggest a change is because they think it clears up some issues there, because if 
If the day, if you define the day of Christ as the rapture there, it seemingly creates a problem because now you have to have the man of sin be revealed and the son of perdition come on the scene before that day can what? Can come. And if that's the case, then do you have a then do you have a pre-tribulation rapture, or do you have to, or is prophecy and other things being fulfilled then before that day of Christ can come? So. The first issue, or the second issue, is to understand right off the bat that we are not suggesting a change. We are accepting that verse as it is. It's Christos in Greek, it's Christ in English, that way 568 times, and there is no reason to change it. The reason why a change would be suggested is because of a misunderstanding in the verses that we're going to try to show you over the next couple days. Okay? So those are some introductory things. And if you look at the last sentence, I think it's critical that we read the last sentence of that point. Uh, just backing up, it says, uh, In their view, if the day of Christ were allowed to stand, as it is, a problem is created in verse 3 when Paul says, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Because then the rapture, or the day of Christ, is to be preceded by prophetic events, thereby violating the prophecy-mystery distinction fundamental to the mid axe dispensational view. So, this idea, if I could just try to draw this, if, if you identify the day of Christ here as the rapture of the saints, where we meet the Lord in the air, okay? If you read verse 3, verse 3 says, That day will, shall not come except what? Two things have to happen. There's, there's got to be a falling away. Well, actually, three things. The falling away, and then it says in verse 3, it says, uh, let, uh, let no man see you by any means for that day shall not come except the coming and falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. So the man of sin is going to come out of the scene, and then third, he's going to be preceded by the son of what? Perdition. So you see the problem, okay? So to get it to... To try to get around the problem, what people have suggested is that this should not be day of Christ, but it should really be day <coughs> of the Lord. Okay? Now, there's no reason for that change. The only reason somebody would suggest this change is they have not accurately understood the day of the Lord first, and they, have, they are not clear on to the issue of the day of Christ. So one of the things that we want to try to clear up before we're done this weekend is to accurately identify what are these terms, what do they mean, and how do they relate to each other. Because we are not suggesting that this day of Christ should be changed to the day of the Lord. Okay? There is no reason for anybody to argue for that change. Other than they don't understand some things about the terminology. Does everybody kind of understand where we're at there? Okay. So, last bullet point under background. The goal then of the Day of the Lord Project is to bring clarity to these issues without altering the text of the King James Bible or violating the basic principles of rightly dividing the word of truth. You need not worry that by the end of this we're going to argue that the tribulation, that, I'm sorry, that the rapture is not pre-trib. Okay. It is. We believe that it is. That's our position, okay? But we also don't think that this is appropriate to say it should be day of the Lord to get around the problem that if you understand it as it is, really creates a better understanding than if you just take the easy way out and say, it's switch it, okay? Now, <clears throat> two major views. Generally speaking, there are two views on the duration and scope of the events included in the day of the Lord. So I'm under the two major views point now. Dwight Pentecost, in his book, Things to Come, summarizes these two views as follows. Okay? So I have charts here, up here on the, on the screen. Okay? The first view. The first view includes, hopefully everybody can see that, it includes the, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, or the tribulation period in the day of the Lord. So it views this entire time, including the, the seventh week of Daniel, the tribulation, the second coming, the kingdom, the great white throne judgment, and the new heavens and the new earth. It views all of this entire length of time as all fitting into what is known in the Bible as the day of the Lord. Okay? 
Okay? So if you look back at your notes, <coughs> day, of the view, Lord, day of the Lord view number one includes, so let's go through it, the 70th week of Daniel right there, or the tribulation, through the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the chart that I want you to look at. Pentecost quotes the following from Ironside's James and Peter as an example of this view. So if you would uh, just follow along with that. It says, when at the last the day of grace is ended, the day of the Lord will succeed it. The day of the Lord follows the rapture. It will be the time when the judgments of God are poured out upon the earth. It includes the descent of the Lord with His saints to execute judgment on His foes and to take possession of the kingdom, a reign in righteousness for a thousand glorious years. So Ironside says that this entire time, beginning with the 70th week, the tribulation period, running all the way through to the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth, that this entire time period is all called in the Bible the day of the Lord. Okay? That's the first view. Any questions about that? I said I wouldn't take questions, but you know how it goes. Yes? Who is H.A. Ironside? H.A. Ironside is a, uh, a biblical writer, um, commentator. Harry Ironside. Harry Ironside, yes. Okay. So view number two. View number two includes the second coming of Christ through the new heavens and the new earth. Okay. So notice that the second view includes everything that the first view included, with the exception of what? The 70th week, the tribulation. Okay? So the second view, so this is the first view, includes the entire span of the tribulation all the way to the new heavens and the new earth in the first view. The second view starts at the second coming of Christ back to earth and spans all the way out to the new heavens and the new earth here, but it excludes the tribulation. It excludes the 70th week of Daniel. Okay? And so, if you would look at page 3 now that I'm on, Pentecost quotes the following from the Schofield Reference Bible regarding this view. <coughs> the day of Jehovah, also called uh, that day and the great day, is the lengthened period of time beginning with the return of the Lord in glory and ended with the propagation of the, of, of the heavens and earth by, the fi by fire preparatory to the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? So, Schofield says that the day of the Lord starts where? The second coming, and then it lasts all the way over here to the new heavens and the new earth. So, Schofield differs from Ironside in that he says that the tribulation is not to be included in the day of the Lord, but that the day of the Lord comes to earth at the second coming of Christ and stretches all the way over to the new heavens and the new earth. Alright? These two views agree as to the conclusion of the day of the Lord. Okay? Both views end the day of the Lord with the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. Alright? but differ on the beginning. So just again, the first view begins it with the start of the tribulation and goes all the way to the new heavens and the new earth. The second view <coughs> starts it at the second coming and goes all the way over to the new heavens and the new earth. So again, they agree where it ends. They do not agree about where it begins. Okay? So the first view includes the day of the Lord includes, I'm sorry, in the day of the Lord, the events of the tribulation, while the second view does not. Now, ultimately, Pentecost, white Pentecost, sides with Ironside. So Pentecost is going to say that the correct view is the first view. So let's read what he says. If the day of the Lord did not begin until the second advent, which is what Schofield said, since that event is preceded by signs, the day of the Lord could not come as a thief in the night, unexpected and unheralded, as it is said to come in 1 Thessalonians 5.2. The only way this day, the day of the Lord, could break unexpectedly upon the world is to have it begin immediately after the rapture of the church. It is thus concluded that the day of the Lord is that extended period of time beginning with God's dealings with Israel after the rapture, at the beginning of the tribulation, 
uh, tribulation period and extending through the second advent and the millennial age under the creation of the new heavens and the new earth after the millennium. Now, folks, here is what happened. Pentecost wrote that view, <coughs> articulated that view, supported that view, and propagated that view. Whose book then becomes the best-selling book of eschatology? Pentecost. When Pentecost's book becomes the best-selling book on eschatology, that view then becomes the standard accepted view amongst virtually almost all dispensational premillennialists on how to understand the issue of the day of the Lord. So there's a, there's a real emphasis here because, in other words, and I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit for the purpose of summary, so because Pentecost said it, it's got to be what? True. It's got to be right. Okay. So Pentecost, to his credit, he does explain both views. So let's be clear and fair. He explains both views, okay? But then he says in the end that the first view that includes the tribulation in the day of the Lord, that this is the correct view. And he says the reason why this is the correct view is because the only way the day of the Lord can come as a thief in the night is if you include the tribulation period in the day of the Lord. Now, Dave Reed has an entire, the first session tomorrow morning is all about the issue of the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Okay? Before we get to that, we have some other things that we need to look at here uh, this evening to prepare for that. So Norman Geisler states the following regarding the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, in similar terms, are used of end time events re uh, uh, referred to tribulation period. On through the millennium. So, Geisler is saying the same thing as who? As Pentecost. Okay? The Day of the Lord entry in the Dictionary of Premillennial Theology, written by Arnold, whatever his name is, uh, states in part, the most common biblical term for the seven years of tribulation in both Testaments is the Day of Jehovah or the Day of the Lord. There are many who use there are many who use the term the day of the Lord to apply to both the tribulation and the messianic kingdom. Okay, so the first point here is to lay out before you as clearly as we can that there are two approaches, there are two views to understanding the day of the Lord. Okay, one of them includes the entire tribulation all the way through to the new heavens and the new earth. The other one says no. It starts with the second coming of Christ and goes out through the new heavens and the new earth. So again, both agree about the end, both disagree about the beginning. Okay? So if you look at the last point in that section, in summation, the commonly held view amongst premillennial dispensationalists is view number one, i.e., that the day of the Lord includes the 70th week of Daniel. The goal of the Day of the Lord project is to prove conclusively from Scripture that view number two is actually the correct view. Okay? So this will be a natural pause. Does anybody have any questions about that point? Just trying to keep this a little more informal than a, 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 a sermon. Yeah? Are there any other views that have a minority following among um, those who write the Bible? Uh, I'm sure there are, but generally these are the, the two dominant ones. So the next thing we need to do then is we need to define the day of the Lord. Okay, If we're going to understand anything about it, we've got to define it. We've got to look at what does the Bible say about the day of the Lord. So what, what I want to do, uh, if, if you look at the next point, defining the day of the Lord, in addition to the phrase the day of the Lord, okay, the expressions that day... The day and the great day occur, occur more than 75 times in the Old Testament. Okay? So there are other related terms that are used in the context to, de to describe the details about the day of the Lord. Okay? So what we want to do in this section, what the goal of this section is, is to investigate each occurrence of the phrase, the expression, the day of the Lord, in their canonical order. In other words, in the order in which they appear in the Bible. And as we do this, what we want to do is we want to glean and understand what are the key characteristics of this day of the Lord. 
Because we can't go any further to look at the issue of the timing of it until we've understand, understood the fundamental nature and character of what the Bible says about the day of the Lord and what it is fundamentally going to be. And as you're going to see, it is a very, there are a lot of different things that the Bible has to say about it. So I'm going to go to Isaiah, let's come over to Isaiah chapter 2, and we'll just start following these through. <coughs> Can I ask, um, the day of Christ in Scripture, how many times do we have that? Tomorrow we'll talk about that. The interesting thing about the day of Christ, and that's actually, I appreciate you bringing that up. The day of the Lord is a prophetic term, and it's used in the Old Testament. The day of Christ, and the, vari the variations of the expression day of Christ, are found only in the Pauline epistle. Okay? So you have the day of the Lord in prophecy, and then you have the Pauline terminology, the day of Christ. The day of Christ, you don't find that expression used anywhere else in the Bible but in the epistles of Paul. The day of the Lord is used throughout the Old Testament in the parts of the New Testament. And Paul even quotes a verse, I'm sorry, he, he, he uses the term to refer to that prophetic event, as you'll see as we go through the list. So Isaiah chapter 2 is the first occurrence. <coughs> Look with me at verse 11. It says, the lofty looks of men shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. What day? Verse 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts. So what do we know from verse 11 about the nature of the day of the Lord? Who alone is going to be exalted in the day of the Lord? The Lord alone. So one of the characteristics, one of the defining elements of the day of the Lord is that it is a day when the Lord alone is going to be what? Exalted. Okay? So verse verse, uh, verse 11 again. The lofty looks of men shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon, upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon the mount, uh, upon the mounts, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, upon every fenced wall, verse 17, drop down verse 17, and the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be what? Exalted in that day. So the day of the Lord, the fun, one of the fundamental defining characteristics of the day of the Lord is that the arrogance and the haughtiness of men is going to be utterly what? Utterly put down. And who alone is going to be exalted in the day of the Lord? The Lord. Now that just makes sense, right? Because whose day is it? It's the day of the Lord. It's the day that belongs to who? The Lord. Look at verse 18. And the idols shall be utterly abolished. And they shall go into the holes and the rocks and the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. To go into the clefts of the rocks and the tops of the ragged rocks for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. So if you look at the summary points there, number one, the day of the Lord is a day where the proud and lofty are brought low. Number two, and most importantly here in my opinion, the Lord alone is going to be what? Exalted in the day of the Lord. And third, men go and hide from the presence of the Lord as he arises to do what? Shake terribly the earth. So in other words, is he coming in judgment in those verses? Okay? Let's come to Isaiah chapter 13. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 13, look at verse 6. Isaiah chapter 13, starting in verse 6. <coughs> How will he, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as, de as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all the hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain of a woman as, uh, that travaileth. And they shall be amazed at one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Notice verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. 
both uh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened uh, in, in his coming forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terror. So, the day of the Lord, number one in these this verses, is a day of destruction from the Almighty. Okay? It's a day of wrath and fierce anger, where the sinners are destroyed. I'm on page four now. It is also associated with it are cosmic disturbances. Look at verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, and the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So there's cosmic disturbance associated with the day of the Lord. And then lastly, in verse 11, it talks about how the arrogance of the proud will cease, and how the haughtiness of the terrible will be laid low. So again, we see a situation where the loftiness of man is all going to be what? Put down and ended so that who alone can be exalted? The Lord. Okay? So the Lord's clearly viewed as coming in judgment here. He's clear there's cosmic disturbance. There are all these things that are associated with the day of the Lord. Come to Isaiah chapter 24. Now this is very, what we're doing here, I hope you, you ought not to view this as, this is very, very important what we're doing here because we are, we are defining the character, the nature of this day. This is very important to understanding some things regarding the timing, as you'll see, hopefully, in the next study. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 24, verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord, notice, shall punish the host of the high ones that are where? On high. On high and the kings of the earth upon where? The earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered to the pit. They shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed. When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. So these verses indicate that the day of the Lord is a day where the, he's going to punish the hosts of the high ones. And the kings where? On the earth. On the earth. Okay? Um, so, the, so this indicates that the day of the Lord starts where? Starts where? Something's got to do with heaven here because in that day, he is, verse, verse 12 says, he's going to punish the hosts of the high ones that are where? On high. And then when he's done with that, he's going to punish who? The kings. The kings on the earth. Okay? Uh, there's, there's again cosmic disturbances associated here with the day of the Lord. And the Lord reigns in Zion, and the kingdom is going to be what? Established. Alright? Come with me to Isaiah 34. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 34. Verse 1. Come near ye nations to hear, and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon their armies. And he hath utterly destroyed them, and he shall deliver them to, to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and, and, and their stink shall come out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And their host shall fall down as a leaf falleth off the vine, as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed where? In heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Umea, and upon the people of my, uh, people of my curse to judgment. <clears throat> the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, and with the fat of kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Now look at verse eight. 
For it is the day of the Lord's what? Vengeance. Vengeance. And the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Now, a couple things here. Again, is it a day of destruction and war? Yes. yes. But notice that the sword of the Lord in verse 5 is bathed where? In heaven. And once it's bathed in heaven, then it comes down where? Earth. To earth. The pioneer of Okay? Okay. <laughs> Notice also that it's uh, specifically said to be the day of the Lord's vengeance in verse 8. I'll give you a little tip here. These two verses, okay, about it punishing the hosts of the high ones that are on high, and about his sword being bathed in heaven and then coming down upon Edomia, these are going to be key verses that you're going to want to remember as we go through the studies. Okay, come with me to Jeremiah chapter forty-six. Come over to the next, that's the next book. Come over to Jeremiah forty-six. <coughs> so again, what we're doing here is we're surveying the places where the terminology occurs and looking at the character and the nature of it according to the verses. Jeremiah chapter forty-six, verse ten. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts. A day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be, uh, and it shall be satiate, uh, and made drunk with their blood. And the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Notice again here that the day of the Lord is defined as a day of vengeance on his what adversaries. Okay, it's coming up over and over and over again. Come to Ezekiel chapter thirteen. Ezekiel chapter 13. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter 13, look at verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 5. He says, Ye have, ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel, to stand in the what? The battle when? In the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord here is again depicted as a day of battle that Israel is going to stand there and fight in. Okay? Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 30. <coughs> Ezekiel chapter 30. Verse 3. Ezekiel 30, verse 3. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. A cloudy day. It shall be, it shall be the time of the heathen. And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia. When the, when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and when they shall take away her multitude and her foundations shall be broken down. You can, you, you can read on there, but it's gonna it's, it's all talking about the fact that the day of the Lord is a is a cloudy day. It's a time of the heathen where the God is going to bring a sword upon them. Okay? So it's judgment over and over and over again coming up in all these verses regarding the day of the Lord. Okay? Come with me to Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1 verse 15. Joel, there's, there's quite a few actually here in Joel. Joel chapter 1, look at verse, verse 15. Alas, for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. So again, the day of the Lord is depicted here as a day of what? Destruction. Okay? It's destruction from the Almighty. This is where God is going to get vengeance on His enemies. He's going to, it's the day of the heathen. He's going, to, he's going to waste the heathen. He's going to cut them down. He's going to do all the things. that these, and It's defined as the day of battle. His sword is bathed in heaven. Then it comes to earth. All these things are, are uh, what, what are the, the type of activity that are going to be associated with the day of the Lord. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, Joel 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet inside, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. 
Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now look at verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mounds, a great people and a strong, there hath never been ever the light, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now look at this. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall what? <coughs> When the army of the Lord does this, it's going to come down and it is literally going to burn up everything. Before them, it's, the garden, it's, it's as the Garden of Eden, and behind them, it's what? A desolate wilderness. It's going to be total, complete, and utter destruction in the day of the Lord. Okay? In other words, God is not messing around here. You, read, you can read the rest of this, it talks about this army. Uh, look, at, look at verse uh, 4. And the appearance of them had the appearance of horses. And as horsemen, uh, so shall they run, like the noise of chariots, on the tops of the mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame, of fire that devoured the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their peace uh, face, people shall be much pain, and all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. How do you fight an army that can't die? Okay? So, this is the day of the Lord, the day of darkness, the day of gloominess, the day of destruction, the day of vengeance. As the Lord himself is going to lead his army out of heaven... Lay low the haughtiness of men, destroy the pride of man, and exalt who alone? Himself. Okay? These are all the fundamental ingredients or character of what the day of the Lord is. Look at verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is, the, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible, and who can what? Abide. Abide. <coughs> Look at verse 30. Same chapter. And I will show wonders in heaven, in the heavens, and in the earth, blood and fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and, no and great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. Now, a few things here. Look at your notes on page 4. One view is that the great and terrible day of the Lord is a reference to a particular portion of the day of the Lord. However, it's clear from Joel chapter 2, go back to chapter, uh, go back to verse 11, read verse 11 again. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, and for, and for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and what? Very terrible, who can abide it? It's clear from Joel 2.11 that, that that great and very terrible is a description of what the day of the Lord is like. Not a reference to a particular subdivision thereof. So the entire day of the Lord is what? It's great and what? So there, there's a terrible aspect to it, but there's also a what? A great aspect to it. Now whether or not it's terrible depends on your perspective. <laughs> right? I mean if you're if you're on God's side, as it were, the whole thing is what? Great. If you're one of the people that this is coming upon is certainly going to be one. Terrible. Terrible. Look at chapter 3. <coughs> chapter 3. Verse, start at verse uh, 14. Multitudes. Multitudes. In the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Notice again. The sun and the moon shall be one. And the stars shall withdraw their shine. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, and utter His voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. 
But the Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no, uh, no strangers pass through her anymore. And it shall come to pass that in that day, the day of the Lord, obviously in the context, that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth uh, of the house of the Lord, and shall, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah. Because they, because they they had shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. Notice verse 21. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth where? Zion. See, in the day of the Lord, where is the Lord going to dwell? Zion. He's going to dwell in Zion. And when He dwells in Zion, and when He's cleared the path free of all of His enemies... And he's restored Israel back to their rightful place in the earth. The, de the Lord alone will be what? Exalted. Exalted. Which is one of the fundamental characteristics of the day of who? Oh. The Lord. Look at Amos. <coughs> More in Amos chapter 5. So, I should point out to you in Joel 3... Does the day of the Lord then clearly include the kingdom? Yes. Because it's in the kingdom when the Lord dwells in Zion. It's in the kingdom when all the nations are going to flow back to the nation of Israel. And all those things are going to be uh, going, to, going to happen that are depicted there. Amos chapter 5, look at verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. So what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And if a man and if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned upon his leaned his hand on the wall, <coughs> and a serpent bit him, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? As if, as if a man did flee from a lion? Yeah. Kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, is it Haggai or Habakkuk when he was praying to the Lord, asking the Lord to give him reprieve from his enemies? And God did give him reprieve, but not the way that he wanted. He brought a less, a more wicked nation to judge his own people. It's certainly talking about, you know, in verse 19, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. So he's trying to get away from the lion, but what gets him? There. So oh, it, 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 it's when, when Israel in the tribulation period is everybody going to be out to get Israel? Yes. yes, and we'll see that later on in these studies. That ex, unless those unless the days of the tribulation be short, there shall no flesh walk survive. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be what? Short. Short. We'll get to that tomorrow. Okay. But it's definitely, maybe tonight, I don't remember where it shows up, but it does show up. Go to Obadiah chapter 1. You know, you know how you can remember what Obadiah is about? Okay, the name of the book is Obadiah, right? Obadiah is O Bad Edom. Oh, bad Edom. You can remember what Obadiah is about. Okay, Obadiah is a prophecy about the judgment of God against Edom. Anyway, just throw that in there for filler. <laughs> Verse 15. <clears throat> for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return unto thine, unto thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually, yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down, 
and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their what? Possessions. So in these verses here, we see again, if you go to the top of page 5 now, that the day of the Lord is nigh to the heathen. It's in Mount Zion, where deliverance is the, is the house of Jacob, uh, and so on. Uh, as Israel shall possess their possessions, as, as the verses say. Come with me, look at Zephaniah chapter 1. <coughs> I really hope that you don't view this as overkill here. Because it's very important that you get the complete picture here. Zephaniah chapter 1, look at verse 7. Zephaniah chapter 1, <coughs> verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is what? Amen. Now notice, what does that verse say that is associated with the day of the Lord? The presence of who? So the day of the Lord is characterized by the presence of who? It's the day when the Lord alone is exalted. It's the day where His enemies are put low. It's the day where there's war, cosmic disturbance. All these things are happening. The Israel is, is, is blessed and returns to the land and so on. So all of these things are reoccurring here to show us the nature of this. So it's important that you understand that the day of the Lord fundamentally is the presence of the Lord. And it is the day when the Lord alone is going to be exalted. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 8. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's, in the day of the Lord's sacrifice, that I will punish the princes and the king's children, and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also I will punish all those that leap on the threshold, uh, which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Verse 10. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord. That there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate, and a howling from the second, <coughs> and a great crashing under the hills. How ye inhabitants of, of uh, Mechtish? For all the merchant people are cut down, uh, all they that bear silver are cut down. Verse 12. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles, and punish the men that are settled on, on uh, their leaves. That say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their good shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. And they shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men shall cry there bitterly. Come with me to Zechariah chapter 14. <coughs> Zechariah chapter 14. Look at verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to what? To battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residents of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And they and. and then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Notice verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day where? Oh. Upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there, shall be a very, and there shall be a great valley, and half the mountain shall be removed to the north, and half toward the south, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall, uh, shall reach unto uh, Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Hezekiah king of Judah, and the Lord God shall come, and all his saints with thee, and it shall come to pass in that day. Now, just... 
Skip down to verse 8 with me. It shall come to pass in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former, half of them uh, toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name what? One. one. So in the day of the Lord, who's going to be king over all the earth? The Lord. The Lord. His presence will be on the earth. The day of the Lord is characterized as a day, as the day of the Almighty, where His physical presence is on the earth, and it is the day that belongs to Him. <coughs> so, Christ returns in Zechariah there, stands upon the Mount of Olives in the day of the Lord, and in the day of the Lord, the Lord will be made king over all the earth. Look at me in Malachi chapter four. Verse 5. <coughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it this week in here. It's cold. Bother me. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. But I will send you Elijah the prophet. What's the next word? Before, Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of who? The Lord. The Lord. So we learned, number one, that the day of the Lord is great and what? Great. Dreadful. But we also learned that Elijah will be sent when? Before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. Okay? That is going to be key in our next study when we look at the timing of when the day of the Lord comes. Okay? Go me to Acts chapter 2. Now in Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes the passage we just read a few minutes ago from the book of Joel. And says that it's fulfilled here on the day of Pentecost. Listen, folks, the day of Pentecost is not the day of Pentecost is, is fulfillment of prophecy made to the nation of Israel. Okay? The day of Pentecost is not God dealing with the church, the body of Christ. The day of Pentecost is God fulfilling prophecy made to the nation of Israel. Okay? Now we just read the verses in Joel. Look at what Peter said. Joel chapter 2, verse 17. Verse 16, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by who? The prophet, prophet Joel. So everything that's happening on the day of Pentecost, according to Peter, how many think Peter knows what he's talking about? Raise your hand. Okay, good. So Peter knows what he's talking about. Peter says that all the stuff that's happened here is the fulfillment of what? Oh, prophecy made in Joel 2. Look at verse uh, 17. And it shall come to pass... <clears throat> in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Notice, the sun shall return in the darkness, and the moon in the blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord what? Now, there's no new information there, because everything Peter says there, he's quoting from who? Joel. Okay? Let's come to the one time that Paul mentions the day of the Lord. Come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <coughs> I have some here. If I run out, I'll let you know. You ever hear the joke about... The pastor that sucked on cough drops. Yeah. Yeah, some of you might have heard it before. The preacher's up there preaching and he's he's going, he just keeps going and he's not stopping. And somebody said, somebody says to him, when he finally got it done, he said, What's going on? You usually stop when your cough drops done. He says, Well, I accidentally put a button in my mouth. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter five, look at verse two. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, it says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh 
as a thief what? Now David's going to teach an entire study tomorrow on this issue. Okay? But you need to see it. Now if it were me, here's what I would do if I were you. Let's go back up to verse 1. I don't know if Dave's going to do this tomorrow or not. But every time the word you or yourselves shows up, circle it. Every time the word they or them shows up, circle it. Verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye, circle it. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Thessalonians and are they saved people? Yes, they are. Ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief when? In the night. In the night. Now, now watch verse 3. For when they shall say. You see the contrast. You see the contrast between ye, you, and yourselves. And now watch verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon who? Yeah. Them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall what? Yes. Not escape. But ye, brethren, ye, you, you Thessalonians, are not in the darkness that that day should overtake who? You, you as a thief. Ye are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the darkness, we are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, for they that what? Sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken with. But let us who are of the day be sober. You see the contrast there? He's clearly saying to them that there's an aspect here of the day of the Lord that they don't need to what? worry about. Because it's not going to come upon them as believers. It's going to come upon these folks that are what? Unbelievers. I have a question. Yeah. Pastor, doesn't that mean that the Bible doesn't really mean give a warning to believers for us not to be like them? Where do you see that? In verse 6, so then let us not be like others who are asleep. I mean, he's talking to the Thessalonians. He's talking to born-again believers. <laughs> he's talking to them in the sense of not being not being spiritually, you know, uh, unaware of what's going on. They don't need to worry about what's going to come upon them here because they're not... Verse 8, let us that are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation... For verse 9, for God hath not appointed who? Us. us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by uh, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's clearly making a, a contrast. We'll leave the last one with me now. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. And then we'll have some uh, concluding remarks, and then we'll take a break. 2 Peter chapter 3. Now if you look up here. Okay. <clears throat> Put the one. Have we read stuff about the Lord coming? Yes. Have we read stuff about the kingdom being established and the and, and uh, the Lord being king over all the earth? Yes. Okay. We haven't really read anything about this yet, no. and we haven't really read anything about what? No. Okay. Second Peter chapter three verse ten. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works thereof shall be burned up. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons... What manner, what manner of persons ought ye to be in the holy uh, conversation of goodness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall, shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for what? Heaven. New heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth what? Righteousness. Now, if you read the book of Revelation... We're not gonna, I'm not going to take time to do this because it's easily established. 
Does this happen before that? Yes. It's the great white and the throne happen before the new heavens and the new earth. So if 2 Peter says that in the day of the Lord there's going to be a new heavens and the new earth, then I also know that if the kingdom's included in that, and so is the new heavens and the new earth, then what else is too? The great white throne. Okay? So let's look at the conclusion points. So taking into account the combined testimony of the verses outlined above, we can draw the following general conclusions about the nature of the day of the Lord. Number one. The day of the Lord is a day of destruction and vengeance from the Almighty upon all of His enemies. The proud, lofty, haughty, and arrogant are brought low. This is the day when the Lord shakes terribly the earth. The day of the Lord is described as being great, te great, terrible, and dreadful day of darkness, cloudiness, gloominess, fierce wrath, and anger. When the sword of the Lord is brought upon the heathen. The day of the Lord is a day of battle. In which the Lord commands his armies. Not just on earth but also in heaven. In fact the sword of the Lord is depicted as being bathed in heaven first. And then coming down upon the kings of the earth. The day of the Lord's arrival to the earth is preceded by. Cosmic disturbances. Such as the sun being turned into darkness and the moon into blood. In addition, Elijah the prophet is said to be sent before the coming of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is when Christ will again stand upon the Mount of Olives. It's the day when the Lord is king over all the earth. In the day of the Lord, Israel will possess her possessions and the Lord will enter into his rest by dwelling in Zion. Now we read all this stuff, right? So I'm just trying to summarize this for you here at the end. We saw that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. We said that the day of the Lord, most importantly, is characterized by the presence of the Lord Himself. It is the day when the Lord alone is exalted. Thus, now this is important. Thus the day of the Lord cannot be present. Unless who himself is present? The Lord. the Lord. Because it's the day that belongs to who? The Lord. The Lord. Alright, does anybody have any questions or comments? Sarah? <coughs> um, um, 2 Peter 12. Um, we talked about the fact how the body of Christ is separate from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will <coughs> live in um, the new It's a, good, it's a good question. Um, I'm not totally sure how to answer it off the top of my head, other than to say that the body of Christ will be with the Lord when this happens, um, and not adversely affected by it, just as Israel will also be somehow, you know, um, kept and protected as this happens, because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth presented that wherein dwelleth righteousness, where the saints are going to inhabit, you know, for the, for all the rest of the ages of eternity. So they're somehow um, kept safe when these things happen. I don't, I can't tell you exactly how, but that would be the only thing I would say. And then, um, is the Lord the same as Christ in the situation when the Lord is going to be like two entities were kind of... This is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. The presence, the presence of the Lord, the, the Lord Jesus Christ on earth to destroy His enemies, to get rid of all things that offend, to bring down the, ha the haughtiness, proudness of man, and exalt Himself in the earth, establish His kingdom, restore Israel, all the things that these verses are talking about are going to happen in the day of the Lord. Yes, Christina and then Lois. It talks about Israel being the, the chosen of the kingdom and everything. And what about the Gentiles, though, who are still left on earth? And it, it, it kind of, you touched on <coughs> it, it would be destroyed. Is there no hope for the Gentiles at 
that point in time? The only hope for the Gentiles during during the uh, during this time is to identify themselves with Israel, same as in the Old Testament, because it's going to be these Gentile nations that have aligned themselves against Israel that God comes down. When you read that thing in Joel chapter two about hey, before them it's a Garden of Eden and behind them it's a desolate wilderness, that's talking about the day of battle as the army of the Lord goes out and just, I mean, totally obliterates its enemies. All those verses we read to where it talks about as it was in the day of battle. You, know, you, remember, you remember that expression? It came up a couple different times. If you want to understand what's going to happen in the future, you need to go read what, how God did battle in the Old Testament. When God tells Israel, go take Jericho, what do they do? They, walk, they march around and stuff like that. All that stuff, when, when, Israel, when Israel enters the land, all that stuff is a, is, is a precursor, is a dress rehearsal for when the Lord Himself is going to come and, and do it all. Okay? Lois? This is a simple, maybe, question. We talk about the day of the Lord, but really how many days is this going to take place? Well, that's what we're saying. It's not a day like 24 hours. Right. It's an expanded period of time. So, like you talk about Daniel, three and a half years, and then, um, so what do you think? How many, how many days? Well, the millennium is going to last a thousand years. No, but I mean, I'm talking about when the sun and the moon turn dark, and when the, when all the signs and the trumpets and the walls come on the earth. Uh, that's isn't that Daniel's like three and a half years? And we're gonna. It's a very good question, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about in the next session. <laughs> yes, sir. Isn't God's big value to make for Israel during Roman time? Yeah, there's a lot of... We, I mean, what I try to do is just compress only the specific areas that passage that dealt with that terminology. Because otherwise we'd be here, you know, two weeks <laughs> going, going over, you know, all of that. I'm just trying to give you the, hot, what, the, the essential information that you need to get. Okay. Yeah. So what you've just done is in order to be able to place in time and chronology the day of the Lord, we need a good biblical definition of what that day looks like. Exactly. Before we can before we can identify the timing, we have to understand the nature of it. Because the nature of it will make more sense. The, the timing aspect will make more sense if you first understand the nature of the day. Okay? Frank? I got a pocket full of buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, let's take a 15 minute break and we'll be back in here at uh, 8 o'clock.